All right. Well, welcome to another episode of Big Ideas in App Architecture. Today, I'm very excited to have with us Grant Muller, who is Vice President of Software Strategy and Architecture at a company called Xylem. As we've done on multiple episodes, Grant, what we'll start with is just a little bit about you, your background, how you got into the industry. Um, and then we'll we'll learn a little bit about Xylem. As I, as I said to you earlier, it's 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 such a fascinating a company and industry. It's and I think one that not many people may have heard of or will know a lot about. So I'm excited to learn about about what they're doing and what you're doing for them. But to get us kicked off, let's learn a little bit about you. And maybe for those of you who'll be watching on video, you can explain all that's happening in your background. I know that won't be <laughs> fascinating for people who are only listening. But as I, I think I said to you before. You, you win the award for the most interesting background <laughs> um, in the podcast thus far. So okay. welcome to the show, Grant. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, I think like a lot of the people you've had on the show, um, most of my background is uh, not related to software architecture and strategy. Um, kind of fell into this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of work. If you had told me when I was 10 years old, I actually started you know, developing basic software, like the kind of thing you do when you're a kid and you're writing little knockoffs of scorched earth or something like that. Um, I started doing that kind of thing, you know, and through high school, learned other stuff. Uh, I got really interested in digital signal processing and VST plugins for Steinberg, Cubase and stuff like that. And then uh, when I got to college, I had a bit of a background in, in digital and I really wanted to go into digital film. I, you know, it's end of the nineties and, um, movies like Toy Story had just come out, you know, John Laster's everybody's hero now. And the thought it was, oh, I'm going to go work for Pixar. How do I do that? All right. I go to film. Uh, I'm going to learn all this digital film stuff and ray tracing and render man and, and all this, uh, this kind of thing. And of course got out of college and there's not a lot of work uh, for somebody with that kind of background. And a buddy of mine from high school said, well, you know, we've got a uh, job openings at this company I work for called Cellnet, which is like the most generic sounding company name ever in the, in the, in the early 2000s. Um, so I, I went to work for uh, selling, they did uh, automated metering infrastructure. So it was all remote meter read type of stuff. And at the time, you know, that's, that's early days of what we would probably call IOT now, I guess it's uh, you know, millions of meters deployed out there in the field and you're reading them over a network and uh, taking all that data and providing some kind of minor amount of analytics and billing and stuff like that. So uh, that's kind of how I got involved with software uh, in a professional way. And, you know, 20 years later, I'm still basically working in the same kind of industry. It's expanded a little bit. Um, I'll tell you how I got to Xylem. Uh, about 10, maybe 12 years ago, um, I got involved with a little startup called Vertico. Uh, it was started by uh, a guy named Brian Crow, who lives here in Atlanta. Uh, and I came on as the, the technical director. So um, basically building all the software. It was very, very small. Um, and we were focused on meter data analytics uh, and SCADA and trying to get uh, more data out of the system and more value out of the system. Um, analytics to drive efficiencies and transformer loading and, you know, anything that could cut costs or improve sustainability. And we were doing it in the cloud, which at the time was very like blasphemy. You're not going to be successful. And lo and behold, we had some customers, some very, uh, some very big customers. And um, we eventually got acquired by a company. Uh, who a few years later got acquired by a company called Xylem, where I am now. Um, Xylem is one of the world's leading technology providers for, in the water industry. So we do everything from measurement to movement to treatment. Um, every, there's a, tiny little pumps, little valves that we have, uh, little pumps that we have in these water fountains, uh, sorry, Coke fountains, uh, or in um, boat toilets. And if you have a boat, uh, evidently we have the Cadillac of bilge pumps for your boat. <laughs> I, so, I did not know that. I mean, I did. I do not have a boat, um, but that that's interesting to know. Yeah. The Cadillac of bilge pumps. Yes, yes. you heard so, it here first. Yes. So some some interesting applications. And the more you uh, are around Xylem, the more you're right. It's interesting and amazing. Some of the the stuff that we're doing uh, and, and improving efficiency and sustainability, and some of the applications are just outrageous um, and, and amazing. I mean, if you remember, I don't remember the the cave rescue in Thailand. Uh, we had people, domain experts from Xylem on the ground there working with pumps to try and keep the water out of that so that they can complete that rescue. 
Uh, FEMA uses our pumps. Uh, it's a very big industry. And of course, Census uh, provides water, uh, electric and gas meters uh, in the industry as well. So extremely broad. Basically, we're doing everything we can to sustainably keep the lights on, water moving and your home heated. So everything we can do to help. I think it's really fascinating. I mean, you know, you spend any time on the website and, and certainly you get the, you know, you get the, um, the impression it has a lot to do with water, but there's a lot there. And, you know, as it turns out, uh, water is kind of an important thing to, to people on earth, clean, available water is, is kind of an interesting thing. Well, before we dig a little bit deeper into that, tell us a little bit about the background, you know, so I'll describe it for folks who may not see it on video. I mean, it looks like, I don't know, like, like 15 drum sets back there. This is not a this is not a, 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 you know, a fake background. This is his real background and there's a lot happening. Um, so I, I'm assuming, I don't know, going on a limb here, you like drums, you're into music. Tell us a little bit about that so that people won't leave the podcast wondering what was happening behind you. Sure. This has actually been, so we lived in this house for uh, 10 years now, and this has been my like music studio in an area to just kind of kick back and play drums. It was not my office until the pandemic. And when the pandemic came around, it was uh, sort of a, well, I got to set up shop somewhere. It might as well be right here. And it became a very convenient way. Actually, I started, you know, playing drums more than I had in a while because the two minutes that you have between meetings or five minutes, if you, if you happen to get that, just turn around and play some drums. So it, it's worked out. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a nice way to balance the hobbies that I have and the work like now, I'll be honest, um, you know, you spend all day in here for a couple of years. And at some point you're like, I don't want to be in that office. No matter how great the drums are, I'm out of here. So, uh, but there's also a lot of kids artwork on the, the walls. And um, my kids came to, you know, kindergarten, first and second grade, right around the time the pandemic was going on. So they're bringing home artwork or doing it at home. And I'm like, aren't you supposed to hang this on, on your wall in the office? Well, I don't have one of those. I might as well hang it all up here. So there it is on the back wall. Well, before we get into more Xylem, you know, just one thing about your background that that caught my attention, um, you know, was your desire, I think, to go into, you know, to like digital art or the, or the film business. Is that something you ever, you know, is that something you've kind of done on the side as well? Or, or you know, once you made the transition to, to other lines of work, it kind of fell by the wayside. I'm always curious about people's kind of initial, you know, dreams or aspirations when they, when they graduate college. Just curious what became of that. You know, no, it, it, it isn't. Um, I remember right after I got out of school, uh, Blender, I don't know if you've heard of Blender 3D, it, it became uh, an open source. At the time in school, we were using 3D Studio Max and Maya. And so it was all the kind of thing where if you needed a license for it, you better bring a checkbook. But this Blender thing came around. And it was like, oh, neat. I can still play with IK chains and uh, ray tracing and rendering and stuff like that. Um, but now, nah, once I got involved with uh, real software development um, of assets and stuff like that at work, it, it became something that kind of fell by the wayside, unfortunately. I'm still definitely an, I'm an enthusiast. I like to, any Pixar movie or uh, digital animation uh, that comes out, you know, we, we generally watch it. Um, so I still love to see how the technology is progressing and then the move to the uncanny valley and then back out again. Uh, well, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. As, as a father of three girls, you know, we've, we've watched our fair share of Pixar yeah. and animated movies and speaking of uncanny valley what is that um oh gosh it's tom hanks and it's about yeah. a train the polar express polar express you know yes. like very early i think you know fully digital movie but my goodness that's a that's a frightening two hours yeah uh, that if was you look a, at their faces too long it's like I don't, I don't. yeah we were in the depth of the uncanny valley at that point for sure i, I, I think, think you're right everybody's I think you're absolutely right what's happening <laughs> uh, but we came back out of it. And now the, the what, what's interesting to see is water and hair. Anytime you see a, uh, yeah. those were like the most challenging things uh, when I remember doing this in school, you know, 20 plus years ago, water and hair. And if you watch the progression of water and hair, it's incredible, like how realistic it is. But then you have a cartoon face and so you're, uh, everything's okay. It's still a Well, what always tripped me up, uh, Polar Express, I thought this, but I mean, others as well as the mouth, like in, inside the mouth, you know, it's like, um, you know, the people are speaking and it just looks like, I don't know, very unnatural, very, very, very much the uncanny valley. Uh, well, I know people aren't here to listen about, to hear about that. So why don't we transition back to, to Xylem and kind of, kind of your work today. So software strategy architecture, I mean, what's, 
you know, what's kind of the day-to-day like at Xylem for you, your role? Um, you know, lots of, you're covering lots of different, different industries, I can imagine, and maybe you will hear about lots of different kinds of products and, um, and technology. So maybe talk a little bit about kind of what the day-to-day is, what some of the, you know, what some of the, the technology you're working on is. Yeah, so I think one of the most interesting challenges at uh, Xylem is that we bridge the whole end-to-end solution. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of times when you work with um, IT uh, and IT providers and people that are in the industry, they're normally thinking about it from the point that they get the data and they're doing something with it, showing it on a screen or a UI or something like that. Uh, we're thinking about it all the way down to the like the device that's buried in the ground. Uh, if there's a meter out there in a pit uh, or in somebody's basement, you know, there's technology involved that we have to think about from end to end. Uh, and that makes it really, uh, it's challenging, but it's also really interesting. You never get um, bored with the fact that maybe just looking at data streams and stuff like that. If there's ever a point where you're, oh, I'm so tired of looking at JSON packets, I just want to go, you know, somebody talk to me about um, signals coming off of a SCADA system or something, something different. Yeah, you have that opportunity. Uh, but no, I, we, we call this this kind of operational technology space a, a big part of what we do. And how do we bridge that is an important part of the technology that we're developing uh, all the time. You know, we've got to get it out of the OT network in a secure way. Obviously, cybersecurity and risk are huge uh, concerns in the utility space or in the treatment space. Um, and so, yeah, that part of the technology is a part of the variables that we deal with. And it makes it uh, just a bit more challenging. I mean, it's not as simple anymore as just saying, yeah, just put it in the database and everything's going to be fine. Not to mention just the quantity of data. I think this is something that, um, you know, if you come from FinTech or AdTech or something like that, you're probably used to click data and stuff like that. And that's a huge amount of data too. But um, the time series data coming off of some of these SCADA systems uh, or out of the sensor network or uh, from meters, it's, it's a mountain of data. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, you know, and if you can't share, that's fine too. But I mean, just w- what's a ballpark of kind of like the size? I mean, are we talking petabytes of data? I mean, is it I mean, if you hundreds it up, of terabytes? It's going to be hundreds of terabytes. Uh, we're not quite into the ter- uh, the petabyte range. Now, we would be, um, if let, if you summed up all of the operations uh, of all the utilities, you definitely would be in the petabyte range. And it's going to, to become that pretty soon because the desire for more data, uh, obviously, as soon as you get a little bit of data, they want a little bit more data. If we have a little bit more data, we could get a little bit more data. And there's a point uh, at which there's diminishing returns. Uh, we haven't necessarily hit it yet, but your physical models can get that much better the more data that you have. So if you're coming from you know, collecting a sample once every hour, at some point a data scientist says, well, you know, if I had it every 15 minutes, I could give you a better uh, result. Okay, so you collected it 15 minutes. And then at some point you're down to 256 hertz and <laughs> you're sending a, a whole lot of data. Uh, and you're getting the results uh, that you want, the improvement in the uh, models, the improvement in the network, better efficiency, faster leak detection, uh, the ability to localize a leak in a way that, um, you know, you have to go and dig a bunch of holes to try and find it. We're isolating that to a much smaller space now uh, so that you spend less capital on, you know, where you go put a bulldozer, which is great. I mean, that's, again, the kind of thing when you're solving these kinds of problems, you can see the real world application. It's not just bits on a screen. At some point, it's somebody in the field saying, thank you, I found the spot, it's a huge leak, and I would have spent you know, weeks trying to find this thing. Uh, thanks for helping me localize it, it's really cool. I wish, uh, and I'm sure it's very different technologies, but my gosh, it reminds me of the, our next door neighbor years ago in our old neighborhood, had some kind of leak and literally dug up the entire front yard, like the mm-hmm. entire front yard with a backhoe you know, 15 feet down, it seemed like, I'm like, I, there has to be a better way there has to, to be figure out what's way. happening underneath there. I mean, literally destroyed the entire yard. And oh, by the way, in the process, destroyed the cul-de-sac um, to kind of get to it. Yeah. Water and mud everywhere, I'm sure. Oh That's yeah. It was, it was disgusting. And then of course he didn't really plant grass afterwards and the whole thing kind of looked awful for years. Mm-hmm. So, hmm. So, so kind of, so I, I, and I totally understand where you're going because you're right. I mean, we, we, and I've talked to even on the podcast, but certainly in in the industry, you talk to a lot of folks who aren't necessarily worried about where the data originates or how it gets there. It may be time series, it may be sensor data, but they don't care about that. That's not their problem. They're looking at, you know, data in an OLTP system or an OLAP system or, or other stuff, but you guys have to worry about the whole, the whole chain of custody. I mean, the entire, you know, life cycle of the data, um, 
so, you know, and I know it will vary, I'm sure, between applications and solutions, et cetera. But, you know, you've got data coming from a sensor that's going to make its way into some kind of internal uh, system for processing. I mean, one of the things I'm curious about it, and maybe the answer is, uh, you know, everything or everywhere or everyone. But, you know, who's consuming this data? Is it is it, you know, internally to make better decisions? Is it, you know, other corporations? Is it consumers? Like, I mean, is it would I be a potential consumer for some of the the products and services that Xylem offers? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and actually, um, you know, the primary users are obviously going to be the utility operator, the, the uh, customer service agent or the engineer, field engineer, uh, people that work within the utility that take our solutions, uh, combine it with maybe some of their systems this is a, an area that we're trying to help them quite a bit because they have their own IT, uh, you know, uh, Briar's Nest, I think I guess it's been described as, uh, of stuff that, um, you know, they have to cobble together. So we don't want to uh, exacerbate the problem. Part of what we try to do is to take that information and uh, provide it to them in a way that um, they can make better use of it. Situational awareness uh, and, and a little bit more in terms of their planning and being proactive. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's the utility staff uh, that are the primary users of the software that we develop. Um, or the, the technology solutions we develop. Uh, after that, um, internally, we use a lot of this data for you know uh, planning our own future, plotting our own course. We develop a lot of models, a lot of domain specific uh, type of things related to treatment. Um, and the more data, obviously, that we have, the better we can expand on those models and make them a bit more universal. Uh, so that's that would be the secondary. But we do also have products, especially in our uh, metering space, where you, know, you as the customer of the utility also are exposed to the data that, that we're collecting uh, through either portals that we've created or partners that are taking that data and then showing it, you know, you, you can see your interval rate and um, compare that to last month or last year. So you get an idea of, am I using more power than I used to? Am I using less and when? Um, having that hourly breakdown is kind of an interesting thing. You know, water, you don't use a lot of water at, at home, really. I mean, you see kind of patterns, but if you start to see weird patterns, you might ask yourself that there's something wrong with my refrigerator. What's going on with the compressor? Uh, who keeps turning the air up? I keep putting it back down. It's somebody's doing it at three o'clock in the afternoon. I can see it. I can see it happening. So, <laughs> I think we know who the answer the answer is to that question. D -d -d Universally, it's the same answer. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is a this is an effect. This is a fascinating area for me. I mean, I think especially you know, it, as an individual consumer of, of many utilities, it it feels like it's an area that's ripe for innovation and, and maybe there has been plenty of innovation it just hasn't been you know rolled out uniformly or i'm not aware of it but i, I know you know and i know you guys are big into water and water is certainly an issue at our house but um you know uh, yeah electrical consumption just has always seemed rather opaque to me you know you get kind of like hey my bill is this this month but you know trying to like get down to you know what is consuming that and how and and you know really kind of working to better you know, our own internal usage of electricity has always been kind of a bit of a mystery. I mean, you know, I feel like we haven't evolved much, at least in our house, beyond what my father used to do constantly, which is turn these damn lights off. Who the hell put this light on? Why is it? Why is this light still on? You know, but like. Yeah. And, and my understanding, you know, um, we're focusing a lot on uh, electric efficiency, obviously for the consumer as well. It's something that, that's been a uh, top of mind in the electrical industry too, for uh, a long time as hell, even for the the um, generating uh, function, the generator and, and the uh, distributor, how they can reduce the amount of electricity being used up there. And you see a lot uh, now in the space related to electric vehicle detection uh, so that they can do infrastructure planning because a lot of it is, you know, it, it, um, electrical usage is the demand curve has flattened a bit. It's actually not as steep as it once was. Uh, yeah. Um, oddly enough, this is a, a thing that in the industry you, you see a bit that, that it's not as steep as they had planned. It's still increasing, but not at the rate um, that maybe they would have predicted 20 years ago. And, you know, there's efficiencies around LED bulbs and better windows. That kind of thing is a huge contributor, uh, air conditioning systems. But now that there's electric vehicles back in the, the mix, trying to plan for the um, infrastructure that has to be in place you know, related to transformers, that's something that the electric industry is is uh, pretty focused on now. Just that detection and the knowing this neighborhood's going to have twenty more electric vehicles show up. How do we make sure we have the infrastructure ready for that? 
Yeah, that um, really surprises me. I would have thought, I mean, you know, LEDs for sure, but you know, and all the other things you mentioned, air conditioning, because I know that's always been the biggest consumer of electricity, at least at our house. But yeah, I would have thought with the amount of electrical cars on the road that that would have been, you know, rising rapidly. But eh. it's rising, yeah. But not, we're also that's the space and water too. That the water um, companies they have to use power too to pump water up. Yeah, uh, and so that's another area where electrical efficiency for pumping water. How can we create the right duty cycles and pump efficiency curves that they can reduce their own electric usage because they have to buy power too. So everybody needs power. Um, and you're right. Uh, it's, it's definitely an area where more and more efficiencies can be driven, maybe even more so than, than water. Um, water, it's, you know, leak detection, trying to drive down losses more than anything. Well, let's talk a little bit about the tech stack if we can. Um, you know, what good would this podcast be if we didn't start talking about architecture, Grant? Architecture uh, and technology. I mean, I, and I know, I know you guys have, you know, probably dozens of applications and lots of different stuff. But you know, given given what we were describing, kind of this, hey, it's, you know, we're starting it, it, it very early. The sensors all the way through, you know, to to big utilities, their consumption of data. You know, what what is you know, maybe give us a high level view of kind of how these systems are architected. And again, I know you probably have many, so maybe we pick one. I I, I don't know how best you want to describe it, but I'm, I'm so curious about kind of how a company like Xylem handles this data. I mean, what's that, what's that pipeline look like? Yeah, sure. So I, if you're talking strictly the data, let's, let's talk a little bit about what happens when a sensor is deployed in the field uh, and it could be a meter or a sensor out of these buoys that we put out in lakes in the ocean and that type of thing. Uh, very specialized technology that sits out there for you know, a decade or more. Uh, and it, it has, there's very few standards is the first thing I'll say in the utility industry or in, in this industry, there's not a whole lot of uh, standards to drive um, IOT in a normalized way. Let's, that's becoming more common. You see lightweight end to M and, and uh, standards like that, protocols like that becoming a lot more um, easy to come by. Uh, but in the past, you're dealing with m machines and devices that are out there sending things like Modbus uh, or their own proprietary um, data streams. And if you didn't provide the technology, a lot of what you're doing is trying to figure out, okay, where do I normalize this thing? Am I going to put a device out there in the field that's going to normalize it to a, a gateway, for instance? And we're going to turn that into an MQTT or a co-app stream and connect to a broker in the cloud. Um, are we going to deploy, uh, you know, an MQTT broker or uh, some kind of device management system that understands lightweight end to M? Or do we have to have a proprietary custom software stack all the way up into the head end system where we're translating that now into business data? And it's all of the above. Um, we're, we're more so driving towards standards. You can see that there's a maturity model in the uh, industry as things start to become more digitally available, that a desire for standards is there and modularity so that they, as a consumer, the utility doesn't have to buy an end-to-end -end solution. They want to be able to pick from three vendors and have you know second sourcing and uh, the ability to, to make trade-offs. And just to put it into to layman's terms, or you know, or at least from my understanding, I mean, th the problem that you're describing is that all these sensors are emitting different formats and different technology stacks or, or you know, different formats, I guess, is thus needing kind of different stacks to interpret. And so th there's a there's a kind of a desire underway to get all of these different kinds of sensors, per, you know, perhaps deployed in different places to speak some at least semi coherent and common language so that, you know, every sensor doesn't require its own you know, ETL tool. And that's an interesting thought. I hadn't had, I hadn't thought about that. It's like, how close to the edge do you do that? I mean, is are you admitting in a standard or, you know, is it one hop or is it, am I going to wait until it, it, you know, it gets all the way, you know, to my doorstep before that's interesting. Yeah. And, and obviously the software centric way, the, the way you think about it, um, is you're trying to move into business objects or physical units as far and where you can do it flexibly. You want to do that in the cloud where you can have a, a big ETL system or uh, uh, basically translation functions that say, oh, this is this type of function. I just need to turn it into a meter read or an alarm or a signal for uh, that came off a, set, a SCADA system. And the SCADA s signals, and that's another interesting one where they, there's there's standardization in the, the form of tags and tag names and all that, but then the implementation is up to whatever the implementation engineer. What is so, SCADA? 
Well, I don't know what that uh, is. Supervisory control and device automation, I think is the, <laughs> the, the full acronym. Um, but you see it deployed in water treatment plants and in the uh, okay. pumping systems. And it's it's not new technology. Uh, okay. It's been around since the 70s, Rockwell Automation and companies like um, Modicon. They created the Modbus standard. That's actually one of the things you see a lot is these standards that emerged from a company and they just became the de facto standard because nobody else was driving a standard here. So there's a lot of that. Um, yeah. And you end up having to deal with some of that legacy. Uh, and so, yeah, where do you make that translation? And so the automatic IT and, and kind of software uh, centric approach is let's obviously we want to transform that in the cloud. It's very flexible. We can do that you know, here. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is if, if there's a drive towards more automation at the edge and a desire for more of the edge to make decisions on its own, they have to know the physical units. It, this, this device out here on the edge that's a gateway that just received a pressure reading, it can't be opaque. It can't just be a number. It has to know this is the pressure value. It's, uh, I don't know, 120 PSI. And I need to change this valve uh, to adjust for the fact that the pressure is too high. And if you're doing all that in the cloud, you're making these back and forth transactions that um, it take too long. And that's, we think about long term, is that how we believe our data systems are going to work? And I think the answer is no. And I also would wonder, you know, at Cockroach, obviously, one of the things we talk about all the time is is resiliency and high availability. I mean, I, I would imagine in systems like this, you know, possibly deployed in, in places where communications, you know, maybe aren't as reliable as they are for you and I you know, waiting to send, you know, a signal that needs immediate action all the way up to some centralized hub to process and push back down. If those comms break, you know, maybe some important action isn't happening at the device. So that makes sense. So, you know, so in other words, getting intelligence as close to the edge as possible is something I would imagine in at least some, some cases would be incredibly important. Yeah. I and mean, it's definitely case by case. I mean, in your metering space, it's probably less important uh, in, in your SCADA uh, OT networks where you're trying to drive uh, maybe a water treatment plant action, you're probably looking at something that needs to happen on the edge. And some of it is very driven by cybersecurity and risk as well. I mean, um, unlike many industries, the adoption of cloud is, I would say, uh, slow in comparison to maybe many of the industries that you, you've encountered in, on the podcast so far. Uh, there's still a desire to have those kind of on-premise systems because th there's the possibility of, you know, a cutoff, uh, or just cybersecurity risk. You don't want anybody to be able to get into that. It, and I, this may be kind of a touchy subject, and and if it is, we can we can punt. But I mean, I am curious, what, you know, because you read in the news about about security around utilities in general. Um, you know, I, I've often, I mean, at least in, in, in some part of that's physical security. But I mean, I, I think that the risk to cybersecurity and attacks there is is important across you know, all major pieces of infrastructure. I mean, what are some of the things that y'all worry about? Yeah, so we take cybersecurity risk very seriously. Um, and it's one of the reasons you talk a little bit about architecture. We intentionally architect some of our systems in a way that we can divide the workload uh, and that the, you know, the connector piece and the most sensitive parts are, uh, we can deploy those on-prem. Uh, we try to drive compliance though with the highest degree of cybersecurity standard because it is something that our, our utility partners, they take seriously, and we have to, as a result, make sure that we don't, obviously the last thing uh, our CISO wants is to be in the news because one of our networks was penetrated and uh, somebody shut off, you know, chlorination or something strange at a, at a water treatment plant. And so that's the kind of thing that we are trying very hard to make sure we protect um, with the technology stack that, that we've created. And a lot of it is trying to divide the operational and transactional workload from the analytical uh, uh, workload so that the folks that need data and they just are running queries and trying to do high level modeling and they're trying to do, you know, physics based generative networks on a hydraulic model, then you don't need to do that over here where the operational workload is very high and it needs instant response and also the cyber security risk. So select star from <laughs> operational <laughs> database. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, we, we, we divide those up. Uh, we try to divide those up very cleanly so that you have this notion of many operational systems doing what they need to do, translating different standards from different sensor types yeah. and then unifying it, making decisions local to the, um, the network it's operating in. It's really fascinating. But then the data is, you know, over here in, in mass and we can combine that with other operational systems 
across you know our, our whole deployments base, not just one utility, but many, and um, drive better models that we can then send back down to our operational systems so that they have better heuristics, better hydraulic modeling capabilities, better pump efficiency curves, and all that. So it's a it's a good cycle to get into. The data comes here. We some do summations and we we create a lot of uh, smaller ways of uh, processing the data and we send it right back to the operational system uh, to do its job. What, um, and, and again, it's something if, if you can't, it can't answer, I, I totally understand. But again, working at a database company, I'm always curious about, about the kinds of technologies. I mean, you, you've kind of mentioned two already. I mean, at least two big buckets, you've got some transactional systems perhaps, um, and you've got some, some analytics or, you know, OLAP type systems, and it sounds like kind of doing the right thing, by the way, by, by separating those two. You know, we, we certainly find lots of folks and maybe you've seen this in your past where, you know, you do like, hey, I, here's my all my operational data. And we don't want to necessarily drive reporting out of that, uh, especially for critical systems because things get haywire. Uh, you're just kind of curious about what, what kind of what kind of data back ends. Are, are out there in our operational space. It's uh, it's tends to be your typical uh, RDBMSs, tried and true, uh, SQL Server, Postgres, uh, your typical databases that have wide support. Because if you do have to deploy them on prem, uh, there's probably a database administrator there that knows at least enough uh, to administrate that database. And obviously, if you get involved with a utility large enough, they'll want a specific database technology because they already have that expertise in house. Well, some of what we're doing is just making sure it's you know, not necessarily using JPA or Hibernate, but ensuring that we have the ability to operate on a different data repository if that's, if that's the driver. We're seeing less of that now than we used to. I would say 10 years ago, that was normal to see it. Now it's uh, a lot less typical for uh, a utility to select the database for you. Um, and on the other end of that, you know, if you come up now to our analytical systems, those are almost entirely cloud. The, the, it's hard not to take advantage of the separation of uh, compute and storage. It's too cost effective. Um, you know, we, we used to operate a, a Hadoop cluster years ago and um, obviously migrated out of that uh, within a couple of years. Well, I, you know, I used to work for one of the big, um, Hadoop providers and, you know, interesting technology, uh, back then, I, I think it's the clouds kind of, yeah, kind of uh, taken a lot of that. Um, but yeah, I used to, I used to dabble a lot with hive and, mm -hmm. and H base and some interesting stuff there. So yeah, I was, yeah, yeah we did a lot with stories. Yeah. We, yeah. We did a lot with hive and H base and it was actually that need for us to combine, yeah. you know, if you're talking about hundreds of utilities using your product uh, and they all have their own operational database. How do you run a query across all of those? Yeah. I mean, you're not, I know the buzzword right now is data mesh, but you're not going to data catalog every one of those and pretend to run a federated query or something like that. It's got to go somewhere else so that you can run broad uh, analytics across it. So the only real cost effective way to do it anymore, the expectation especially is, is cloud compute. Um, so we use a lot of, uh, uh, AWS and Azure actually for that. AWS is probably our primary data lake provider at the moment, but um, we have the ability to operate in multiple cloud providers. Uh, and yeah, we're taking advantage every bit that we can of some of the like data lake house patterns as well, where we've got lots of parquet storage and then creating kind of smaller data warehouses that our customers might even have access to. I feel like I'm gonna embarrass myself by asking this question. Um, given that I did used to work for a big data company, but we didn't say this, use this term, but I, I've seen this more recently. I just haven't paid attention to it. Lake house. Cause I'm data lake. We used to talk about, um, and I guess, is this, is this some combination of warehouse lake? Will you kindly without embarrassing me and making me feel super dumb, tell me what a lake house is. Yeah, so if you think about kind of the progression, if you you know there was data warehouses, the, the '90s and early 2000s, everybody had these data warehouses set up, a propensity to use uh, you know nor highly normalized and flattened stuff, and then you moved into the data lake, and it was oh my god, it's all this data, and we can run Hive queries, and it's unstructured, so now we can you know schema on read and all this stuff, uh, and the drive was to centralize the data, just get all the data pushed into that that one central place, uh, and I. I think, you know, we experienced this with our Hadoop clusters, but certainly 
others experience the same thing. When you centralize the data, um, now you have this problem of trying to describe it to everybody. And, you know, I only need to do this one little query. This, this is a huge haystack. And I'm looking for like two needles. Uh, and you're going to tell me it's going to, it's like a three hour query that I'm going to run? Uh, is there a better way? And so I think what I've seen with the lake house is it's literally just taking the data warehouse concepts and making them a part of the data lake. So you have this concept of a huge uh, haystack of data. Well, let me pull off 200 needles so, and I'll structure them in a way that you can now do your business queries. Um, and so we've, we've got a technology that we developed recently that's uh, called Utility Data Lake that we actually offer our customers. It's exactly that. We've taken all their data. We've got an unstructured data store that we're using. And now we can offer to them, if you have BI tools, plug them in right here. We've, we can house this for you. Very cost efficient. Um, so that's that's uh, kind of the next progression. I think if you're following some of the data literature, you see this data mesh thing happening next. It's now how do we have many data lake houses that we can federate and stuff? And still watching it. It's certainly uh, an interesting concept. Um, but it, it's also from a data governance perspective. Whew, it's uh, a lot of work. Yeah, I think. I mean that that was certainly the case when I was involved in it. You know. I don't know what, however long ago it was last 10 years. I mean, and, and I mean, I would imagine, especially given the, the workloads you described were, you know, potentially from lots of different sources. I mean, data governance, just understanding what is in, the, like you said, what's in the haystack can be, can be uh, really, really difficult. You know, earlier you mentioned uh, two technologies I'm particularly familiar with. I don't know if this is something that's, it's used a lot at Xylem, Hibernate and JPA. Is that, is that, are those technologies you guys use? I mean, you guys a Java shop or a little bit of everything? You know, we're a little bit of everything. I would say the dominant um, technologies in our, you know, for coding are Java and Python. Uh, we use a lot of Python. A lot of the domain experts, um, especially if they're coming from a civil engineering background, hydraulics, a lot of the stuff that they've built up is Python. Uh, so we've seen a growth of Python in our stack um to handle all of the different kinds of data modeling needs that they have so and it's it's a pretty versatile um you know language to use for those kinds of things and there's a, a ton of data science libraries also that have built up over time like scipy and pandas and stuff like that so it's very worthwhile there whereas java i don't know that they've quite um excelled in that space but certainly for a lot of our back-end services you know, fixed services that have a job, uh, you're talking like a domain driven design thing, it's going to do this thing, and it's only going to do this thing, just write it in Java, it's super efficient. Um, and the number of Java developers that you can have maintain it and help you, you know, build on it is quite high. So we yeah, those are, uh, I mean, uh, Java has been kind of my language for ever since I started. So I, I keep threatening to try and do other things, but I haven't quite quite gotten there but you know do a lot of spring a lot of a lot of java a lot of hibernate mm -hmm. a lot of jpa yeah. yeah all good stuff it's funny like the uh, degree to which you um you learn a language and at some point you're like i want to learn rust let's learn a little rust and the first thing i don't know if, if you're the same way i am like rust for java developers i just tell me how this works if i'm coming from a java background i want to know what an interface looks like and i want to know what uh you know a generic looks like how do i do that so. i mean you know i maybe it's just because i'm getting older i don't know what's wrong with me i i have these like grand visions of learning new languages i really do i want to i mean cockroach right cockroach for example written in go goes apparently this like hot language it's very approachable you know somewhere back here on the shelf is my go book in fact i ordered the go book and they shipped me two so i have them in like i have like one in my bag that i carry with me and i have one on the bookshelf i don't read either of them um, and I, I try, I do, I, you know, if the cockroach people listening will probably, you know, grimacing, I, I try to read the code and make sense of it. And I can, I guess, but it's like, can we just, you know, why, why do I have to have all these new ones? And Rust is one in particular that like, it's all the rage right now. You're at Rust like all the time. I'm like, why, what, for what? Yeah. Yeah. I had this, I, I learned a bunch of languages at one point, just and I, I remember reading the quote, it was, I think, Alan Perlis, you know, a, a, I think it was a language that doesn't change the way you think isn't worth learning or something like that. And so a lot of them uh, I don't bother with because there's still some kind of object oriented language. And I'm not going to learn anything new from this. 
I learned Haskell and that was one of those like a jarring experience where everything is so different that there's no Haskell for Java developers. It's no, this is just Haskell. This is Haskell for mathematicians, if you want to learn it that way. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like I've kind of given up on the same thing because you start to kind of wave it off and say, well, I can just do it in Java and that's the language I know, so I'll do it. And if somebody wants to translate it to the rest, they can. I you know. Aren't we bad people for thinking that way and doing that? <laughs> I did, however, I learned Objective-C. So I did, um, oh, wow. I, I, I built a game in Objective-C for, for my kids on uh, you know, on, on the older iOS devices before they, they came out with Swift. And that was, that was actually a pretty jarring experience. I mean, not, oh, yeah. not just the language and the syntax, but, you know, you really had to use kind of Xcode mm -hmm. uh, as an ID. And I'm so used to like JetBrains and IntelliJ and, you know, things like that. Like I, and, and they at the time did have an objective C thing. So I made that transition, but man, that was, that was everything about that was different for me. Yeah. And I don't know if I never went through like a major visual studio I did some back end programming in, in C sharp, so mm -hmm. but never the front end type of stuff. So Xcode to me feels like just a beast. Like you open it and you're <laughs> What's there's happening? A, there's a What's storyboard and there's all kinds of stuff. Where's the code? Yeah, How do just, I look at the code? We just can I just go to the code now, please? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for all this. Yeah. Uh funny. Um well I know we're kind of running up on time and I don't want to take more than we are allotted. Um so maybe, you know, kind of some, some things to cover as we wind down, um, you know, what are some things, you know, and again, maybe this is a personal thing. Maybe it's, it's stuff y'all are building in Xylem, but what, what are some things y'all looking forward to? What are, what are some kind of exciting things on the horizon, um, you know, in your world that, that you can share? Yeah. I mean, so we're on the precipice of really driving uh, broad digitization of the industry. I, I guess you can say if you look across uh, the water industry, it is not broadly what you would call digital at this point. And it's a it's a bit of a, uh, a word on the, the tongues of a lot of IT administrators inside utilities, but even inside uh, you know uh, industrials that it's not digital like you would think of FinTech or some of the other industries where they've been digitized for a long time. And that's a big driver for us right now is getting everything inside the utility digital. And that doesn't just mean taking what they have in the field, plugging it in and showing it to them on a screen. It, it's really making their lives digital, their work lives digital. So it's taking what they would have thought of as a normal business process of going out to a facility, putting eyes on the, uh, the asset there and saying, yep, everything looks good. And driving back, you know, to the office to tell their boss, like, how do you change that? into a truly digital workflow where that is pretty unnecessary. And um, you drive efficiencies, drive down costs and start to use uh, that personnel to do more advanced stuff, deploying more infrastructure, more having more money to improve the infrastructure and to spend money on the capital and to really put uh, you know those folks to better use instead of just driving out and putting eyes on a thing. So that's a, a big part of what we're doing now is really trying to transform the utility space into a, a digital operation and not just an operational one. Uh, and that's going to require all the, the technology that we've talked about, SCADA and edge devices and IoT and operational platforms and cloud platforms, but also just rethinking how the, the bit operation takes place, how the business does the work. Uh, and that's, I think that the next challenge for us is really examining the workflows with the utility, partnering with them to understand what's a driver for them and how do they do it today? And not how do we map that, but how do we change that? Interesting. No, that's great stuff. What about, what about for you personally? Any, um, any exciting things on the horizon? Any new books, any new movies? <laughs> you know, we haven't talked about this at all. I'm actually an ultra runner too. Uh, so as an aside, really? yeah, I, uh, I have a big race coming up in July uh, so I'm going to go do a bunch of running. That may be why I don't have any time for Blender, because uh, I spend all, all my time uh, running at this point. Now, Ultra is how long? Anything over 26 miles. So uh, my next race in July is 100 miles. It'll be my 11th 100-mile race. So Your 11th 100-mile race? Yeah. And it, this this is my favorite race. I'm gonna I'm even going to give them a plug. High Lonesome 100. It's the best race in the country. It's in Colorado. Super beautiful. It's the fifth time I've done this one, um, and I just can't wait to be out there. Oh, that's awesome. Um, you are a much, much better man than I, I, uh, I struggle to, to find motivation to, to move my arms and legs a lot. 
uh, let alone go run. So um, uh, that's awesome. Well, Grant, listen, this has been really fascinating. Um, Learn a lot about an industry I didn't know about, a company I didn't know a lot about. Um, So it's been a real pleasure uh, hearing from you. Hopefully we have you on again. I'm sure there's lots more we could talk about. And if we can't have you on the show, you're an Atlanta guy. We can always meet for lunch. That's true. Um, So again, thank you very much. Glad to have you on the show. Look forward to talking to you again. Thanks for having me. It was great. 